Welcome to the Spotlight Session, hosted, uh, sponsored by Cargill. My name is James Chang. I'm the Global Inclusion and Diversity Business Resource Group Leader for Cargill. And I am honored to be able to uh, welcome our next speaker. Her name is Caroline Belden. Uh, she's the Innovation and Learning Manager for the Winters Group. Please welcome her to the stage. Hello, everybody. As James said, my name is Caroline Belden, and I work for the Winters Group, and I'm really honored to be here today. And today I'm going to be talking about decentering the dominant narrative. Um, but first, I want to show a video, and this is a video of Tiffany Lofton, who is the director of Youth and College Division at the NAACP. And this is a video of her from a few weeks back at the March for Our Lives in Washington, D.C. On March 24, 2018, we're here for three important reasons. Number one, what they will not do is ignore black voices. Number two, what they will make sure to do is include our agenda in the agenda for gun prevention reform. When we talk about legislative issues and solutions for gun violence, it has to include the intersections of black violence. That means guns, that means gangs, that means schools, that means teachers, that means police brutality, that means state violence. It has to include all of that stuff, and we're going to be able to do this together. This is not just about white people in school shootings in the classroom. They kill us in churches. They kill us on the streets. They kill us in the... In the so I'm going to be honest, this video makes me really uncomfortable. I feel like she's really angry, and this is a very uplifting space. Andrea is singing Rise Up in the background. I feel like she's being divisive. Why did she have to bring race into it? That's not what this is about. We all want our children to be safe. I see some of you looking at me like I'm crazy, and that's not actually my reaction to this video. But it might have been six or seven years ago, and that's where I want to start. Because in order to learn how we decenter the dominant narrative, we have to know what it looks like to center the dominant narrative. And sometimes it looks like cutting people off, like I just did in that video. And sometimes it looks like calling people divisive when they're trying to speak their truth. And so what I was really doing in that moment was telling a story about her based on my own discomfort with differences, my own discomfort with my whiteness and the way the world looks at me versus the way the world looks at her. And so I was telling that story about her instead of listening to the story that she was trying to tell me. And I was centering my discomfort instead of centering her truth. And so that's the dynamic that I want to talk about today. And I want to talk about it through the framework with, of equity. And so when I talk about equity, I like to use the definition um, that Black Lives Matter activist and educator D. Ray McKesson uses when he says, the difference between equality and equity is that equality is everyone getting the same thing, and equity is everyone getting the things that they deserve. And so I want to follow that up with two questions. Am I getting the things that I deserve? And if so, am I willing to stand with and elevate the voices of those who are not? And so part of equity, everyone getting what they deserve, is that everyone deserves to share their full narrative. And everyone deserves to be their full selves in the workplace. Right? We talk about that a lot in DNI. And so we know that it's also harder for people from historically marginalized groups to be their full selves and to share their full narratives without other people sharing narratives about them. And what I want to do is talk about what I, how um, we define marginalized, and so I want to define it, treat a person as insignificant or peripheral. And so if we're working towards equity, I want to talk about decentering the dominant narrative, because with equity, no person, no narrative is insignificant or peripheral. So what is this dominant narrative that we need to decenter? And I really could not help myself from using this picture, because it really just embodies what we think of when we think of the dominant narrative, right? But simply broken down, the dominant narrative is the narrative of any dominant group in our workplace, in our society, in our families. And that can be visible or invisible. So in the US, dominant groups might include white, male, able-bodied, citizen, cisgender, straight, and so on. And these dominant groups have a history of marginalizing non-dominant groups in our society. And they can either do that by perpetuating social and cultural norms to the exclusion of others, or they can do that by sometimes aggressively or even violently defending those social and cultural norms, right? So a range of ignoring women in the workplace to sexual assault, a range of telling a racist joke to Charlottesville, right? And so all of these things 
are part of the dominant narrative, subconsciously or not, trying to control that space and control power. And part of the privilege of being part of the dominant group is knowing that you belong, is knowing that your voice is valued, is knowing that you will be deemed worthy of protection or deemed worthy in general, right? It's also being the norm. But when we normalize the centering of one group of people, of one type of person, we also normalize the marginalization of people who don't fit into that group. So how do we decenter? How do we decenter the dominant narrative? I'm going to give you three steps. Resist the urge to other, practice inclusive listening, and shift the focus. I'm going to start with resisting the urge to other. So what do I mean by othering? I mean that people in the dominant group create narratives that distance us from our cultural others, right? So we not only create narratives that center us, but we create narratives that distance us from them. I'm going to give you an example of how we do that particularly in times of crisis. So I'm going to give you a couple headlines. And this first group of headlines is about white men who have committed murder, who have committed mass murder, who have committed acts of terrorism in the US. Right? So Las Vegas gunman Stephen Paddock was a high stakes gambler who kept to himself. Charleston shooting suspect Dylan Roof became a loner in recent years. Santa Barbara shooting suspect was soft spoken, polite, a gentleman. Deputy who killed Marine out of fear for children's safety, officials say. So because they're white men and whiteness and male is the dominant groups in our society, we give them narratives that make them relatable to us. We give them narratives that make them worth protecting. We need to protect the people who are lonely and angry. We need to protect the people who are just doing their job. We need to protect the regular person who might be angry. So at best, they're emotional. At worst, they're mentally disabled, but either way, we can relate to them, right? So we create narratives that, that help us to relate to them instead of actually condemning them or condemning what they're doing. Here we have some headlines about young black men and women, some kids who have been harmed or killed unarmed by police. They're no saints, they resisted. They're drug dealers, they're rappers. Right? So in general, we give them narratives that make them different from us, that distance them from us, but mainly that make them, that do not compel us to protect them. Why should we protect the drug dealer or the person who does drugs? Why should we protect the person who's resisting? Why should we protect the person who's not doing what they're supposed to do or acting right? And so we do this often, but how do we resist the urge to other? First, we have to analyze the narratives that we have about our cultural others. We have to analyze our own narratives. So for instance, men, what are the narratives that you have in your head about women that distance them from you? White folks, what are the narratives that you have in your head about people of color that distance them from you? Straight folks, what are the narratives that you have in your head about LGBTQ folks that distance them from you? And then are we perpetuating those narratives on an organizational level? And if we're trying to close the gaps, which I hope we are, which I hope is why we're here, right, then we need to practice inclusive listening. Before I kind of explain what inclusive listening is, I'm going to show another video. And this is a video of a woman who's sharing stories about um, her interactions with people um, as a woman with disabilities. Years later, I was on my second teaching round in a Melbourne high school. And I was about 20 minutes into a year 11 legal studies class uh, when this boy put up his hand and said, hey, miss, when are you going to start doing your speech? And I said, what speech? You know, I'd been talking to them about defamation law for a good 20 minutes. And uh, he said, you know, like your motivational speaking. You know, when people in wheelchairs come to school, they usually say, like, inspirational stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's usually in the big hall. <laughs> and that's when it dawned on me. This kid had only ever experienced disabled people as objects of inspiration. We are not, you know, to this kid, and it's not his fault. I mean, that's true for many of us. You know, for lots of us, disabled people are not our teachers or our doctors or our manicurists. We're not real people. We are there to inspire. 
So what she's talking about, right, is that not only have we created narratives that distance people with disabilities from us, those of us who are able-bodied, but we have created narratives that have put them on a pedestal in a way that objectifies. We have dictated the narrative for people with disabilities and written it into the structures of our society and then ignored the way that these narratives have created obstacles for them. But what if we listened and what if we practiced inclusive listening in particular? And so, to be honest, originally I was going to talk about active listening at this step, but in some conversations with colleagues, um, we talked about that we needed to go a step further, right? So we needed to go a step towards listening with empathy, towards listening intentionally to what the person is trying to say, rather than, like I talked about earlier, listening and then trying to come up with some kind of response or trying to come up with what my own narrative for that person would be, right? And so inclusive listening, the major shift, is listening not for what's relevant to me from what they're saying, but what's important to them. It's listening to better understand them rather than to better, to better understand how they fit into whatever I'm thinking my narrative is. And so we need to, instead of asking, what does this mean for me, right? What does this mean for me that you have a disability, that you're my inspiration? Well, great. But the real question is, what does it mean for you to live in the world with a disability in a world that is not set up for that? So once we have practiced inclusive listening, resisted the urge to other, we need to shift the focus. And this is when it becomes pretty literal and sometimes even physical. So shifting the focus means that we not only need to inclusively listen to people as they continue to be at the margins, right? What's your story over there? Tell it from over there so I can sometimes not listen or cut you off when I want to. But we need to listen and we need to bring people and allow people and have them be centered so that we're not listening from the center with our ability and power to still cut people off. So that's what shifting the focus is. And I don't know if any of you saw um, the viral video of Tony Robbins from this weekend where someone kind of disparaged women who were part of the Me Too movement at one of his big conferences, or he did, and then a woman stood up and tried to defend the Me Too movement and was saying, I think you're really misunderstanding it. And he physically got in her space and was pushing her back because he was so uncomfortable with her being centered, right? He was continuing to try and center himself. So it's exactly what not to do, but what do we do, right? And so let's talk about it in the context of the Me Too movement. If you have a man who realizes, wow, I'm taking up a lot of space, and there's a lot of women who are trying to share their truth, right? And maybe, maybe there's not enough room for them, so I need to make room. So my, a man might need to actually take a step back, make space for women to share their truth, right? But then, as what happened with the Me Too movement, white women are getting all the attention because they're white. And so they might say, we need to make space for women of color who might have different goals different experiences, specific pain that needs to be addressed. And so they might take a step back and make room for women of color. And then women of color who are citizens might say, wait a minute, we're not all citizens because this is a country of immigrants, right? And so we need to make room for people who have specific experiences around that. So they might take a step back and make room for women who are immigrants so that we can come up with specified solutions for different intersections of people. Right? And so that's what decentering could look like. And what happens when we decenter and center groups that have normally been marginalized is that no one is centered forever. It's dynamic, right? Within our intersectional identities, there will always be a moment where you need to take a step back and think there needs to be space for someone else. And there will always be a moment where it's your turn to be centered and to share your story. And so I was thinking of a moment when I've done this or when I like got it, when I was like, oh, I know how to do this. I can do this all the time. I'm always thinking, resisting the urge to other and practicing inclusive listening. And I thought that was not one big moment. It was definitely a lot of really small, awkward moments. Like the first time I was in an African-American studies class in college and I was for the first time ever the only. And I thought, wow. Not everyone in this room is going to echo my experiences. And more out of discomfort than anything else, I just sat and listened. It was the only thing I knew how to do. And that ended up being a huge learning experience for me. 
And so five years later, when I was facilitating a racial justice dialogue in Ferguson at a black church, I had to throw out my agenda, right? It was that moment where I threw out the agenda because there were a lot of black men and women in the room who still had not been heard, who still needed to be heard. And it was a moment not long after that when I was doing a similar dialogue in a white church and I was getting responses about police brutality, like people just need to follow the law and why are they breaking windows? And it was another moment where I had to, instead of be like, I know, this is hard, ah, and I had to take a step back from that part of me that just wanted to make everything better and share the stories of the people that I had heard talk to me about this in their absence. And it was also moments where I really messed up, where I thought my voice really needs to be added to this situation and it really does not. Or I thought I really can help and I'm gonna help before asking what I can do. And yes, there will be a shift in power, right? When we decenter dominant narratives, people in dominant groups will lose some of that control, but they have so much more to gain. By decentering the dominant narrative, we make room for authenticity. We make room for innovation and growth and connection. And ultimately, we can't get to equity without decentering the dominant narrative. We can't get to equity without making space for narratives that have traditionally been at the margins. And so staying woke requires more from us than just listening to people as we continue to be centered and listening to people from the margins and cutting them off when we want. It means being awake to the ways that we perpetuate marginalization by centering ourselves or by not realizing and being aware of when we are centered. It requires us to center justice and narratives of those who are suffering injustice. So the next time that you realize that you are centered and that your centering is taking up too much space and is potentially marginalizing other folks. Resist the urge to other. Practice <laughs> inclusive listening and shift the focus. Thank you. Mm -hmm.